Oh, Atlas, I see you've re-released yet another of your flagship games, something you seem to really love doing. If I didn't know any better, I would think that you're trying to make as much money as possible from your dedicated fans, but come on, I know you'd never do that, right? Persona 5 Royal is an updated version of Persona 5. It was released on October 31st of 2019, but because it's a Japanese game, as you can tell from the Kawaii Desu characters, it wasn't released for the West until March 31st of 2020. If you're interested in Persona 5 The Royal, let me give you two warnings right now. One. This game is very long, longer than Ron Jeremy, so if you binge it like I did, be prepared not to see the sun for a while. 2. Don't directly look at the sun, I'm now legally blind. As a quick disclaimer, I admit I am a fan of the Persona series overall, but I'm going to analyze this game as objectively as possible because I think that any full price game that is re-released after only 3 years deserves some scrutiny. I'll be dodging major spoilers for the main story as best I can, so pretty much anything story related after this date will not be shown. Hopefully by the end of this video we can determine if Persona 5 Royal is worth your time time and money. So sit down, eat some pancakes, and let's get into it. Persona 5 is very hearty, with a lot of content jam-packed throughout, so it's really hard to find a good starting point to talk about it. So I first want to mention what this game wants to convey from the second you start it up, the theme. Like other Persona games before, this has a theme in both its presentation and story. For example, Persona 3 had a theme based around overcoming the fear of death, using somber colors like blue and sickly green to amplify the mood of its theme of death and decay. Persona 5 follows in the footsteps of its predecessor as well, with a unique theme that gives this game a purpose. This story is about individuality, freedom, rebellion, and change. Within the context of this game being set in Japan, a country that practically has a culture of overbearing expectations, unproductive politics, and societal norms that frowns upon saying what you actually think or feel unless you're bumfuck drunk. The very theme of this game screams rebellion against the established pressures placed on people in Japan. And you can feel that theme in the color palette that's used throughout the game as well, using bright reds and deep blacks that show not only the sense of stress and danger within the main story, but also create striking visuals that impress sort of a fuck off, I do what I want vibe. The rebellious theme is conveyed very clearly in both the original and royal exclusive cinematic openings, the idea of taking your individuality in stride and not giving a shit what society thinks of it. Both openings are fucking beautiful to boot, and while I personally prefer for the original opening for its incredibly animated movement and use of restricted color palette, Royal's opening does well in conveying its ideal while doing the opposite by purposely using an unrestricted color palette and being slightly more overt in expressing its theme of freedom. But no matter which you prefer, the opening cinematics do a great job at making you want to play the game. And that's what they're meant to do. They show off as much as possible to make you get excited for what you're about to get into, and they do that perfectly. Now to get to the meat of the game, its story and gameplay. Persona 5, like its predecessor, is a a JRPG that has a double life between a social sim and a turn-based dungeon crawler. It immediately places you into the role of Joker, a thief being hunted down presumably because of an ongoing heist at a casino. This introduction shows off the game's movement, combat, and some of the new Royal exclusive content like the grappling hook and the new playable character Kasumi. It pulls a Sly Cooper 3 where you have a full team of people you haven't met yet helping you in the heist, which sets up the characters decently enough for when you eventually meet them later in the game. At the end of this short tutorial, after defeating some monsters called Shadows, your core by the law and taken into custody. After some casual police brutality and some hard drugs, you're forced to give your signature for a confession under your name, which is a brilliant segue for the game to allow you to name your character. A hey, please for the love of fucking god, step on me. Lovely prosecutor shows up for questioning with you, where while she is short on time, wants to hear the truth about everything that you have done up until you were arrested. This creates a really fun storytelling dynamic as everything that transpires is told through a recollection of events, which means that no matter what, you're going to be pulled back into a cruel reality of interrogation time and time again, no matter how positive things may seem in the past. That looming presence of dread is really refreshing to have in a story, but where this story all begins is at a time before April, where you white knight so hard you get sued by the most evil of creatures in the world, a bald man wearing gunner glasses. You get placed under probation for a false assault charge and you're forced to move away from your hometown to attend school in the city of Tokyo, as the stigma of a delinquent criminal doesn't give you many options when applying for education. At the beginning of April, the start of a new school year in Japan, you set off to meet the Guardian who'll be providing residence for you. But before that, while finding your way through the city, a mysterious app installs itself onto your phone, creating a foreboding and supernatural scene on the crosswalks of Tokyo. Yep. 
Uh, that one is going to the recycling bin. High rate at one out of five stars. After meeting with Sojiro Sakura, a cafe owner and your probation guardian, as well as meeting with the school staff, you start your life as a bona fide Japanese schoolboy. During the night, noticing that the weird app has again installed itself on your phone, you delete it once more and go to bed, only to have a kinky dream role playing as a prisoner while twin wardens Caroline and Justine, along with their master Igor, the Pinocchio esque man, introduce you to the Velvet Room, a place between mind and matter dream and reality. Igor tells you that ruin will soon come upon the world, and that the only way to avoid it is through his guidance and the rehabilitation of the prisoner. The conversation is cut short and you are left to wake up the next morning. On the way to your first day of school, you have a chance encounter with a beautiful girl. While believing this to be the start of your new anime harem, you're cucked by a horny crimson chin who is also a gym teacher. Shortly after, you cross paths with a bleach blonde boy, Ryuji, that has an utter hatred for this gym teacher, Kamashi. As you walk to school with Ryuji, you both stumble onto a castle in the place where your school should be. Being curious to what the fuck is going on, the both of you investigate to find that Kamashita is the ruler of this castle and orders for your execution. Moments before Ryuji is to be executed, and moments after I had turned down the volume on my speakers because I didn't want my household to question my pastimes, you awaken to the mythological ability of a persona which gives you the power to fight the otherworldly beings that have incarcerated you. As you get away, you encounter a walking tumor that broke a deal to release him from his jail cell and ensures that he will assist you in your escape from the castle. After fighting the occasional enemy and being further introduced to team-based combat, the juveniles escape the castle with the help of the cat creature Morgana. Returning to reality, you find that you are both extremely late to school and encounter Kamashita, who seems to have no idea of the events that transpired, but doesn't hide his prejudice for what he sees as two delinquent students. After introducing yourself to your class, who perceive you as nothing but a threat due to rumors spreading of your criminal record, Ryuji tells you to see him on the roof to talk, questioning if what transpired was real or not, you have a chat with Ryuji who wonders if there's a way to return to that castle, and the next day, the both of you retrace your steps in hopes to find the castle once more to no avail. But you realize that the mysterious app that keeps installing itself onto your phone is a navigation app that allowed you to visit this strange world. Heading back into the castle once more and meeting with Morgana, he explains that this world is one built from the cognition of people with extremely distorted thoughts and desires. When someone has extremely fucked up ideals in the real world, it materializes in this other world as what they perceive their environment to be. In this case, Kamashita believes the school to be a castle that he rules with an iron fist. As you discover more about how Kamashita views his students to be in his mind and his cruel abuse of the students on his volleyball team, you're eventually cornered by monsters under his command, which forces Ryuji to awaken to a persona of his own. After escaping from the castle once again and trying to find a way to expose Kamashita in the real world, you find that nobody is willing to speak up about the abuse. While you and Ryuji struggle to find a way to take down Kamashita, Morgana tells you there's another way to get Kamashita to confess to his crimes. By stealing the materialized desire of Kamashita in the other world, it would turn him into an honest man in the real world, to which he would freely confess to his crimes but with the possibility that doing so may kill him. After a further conflict through Kamashita's actions force a girl to attempt suicide, both you and Ryuji confront Kamashita who tells you that he's going to expel the both of you for uh, assaulting him. With no other options, the both of you delve back into the other world to steal away his desires in hopes that he won't have you expelled. This is the start of the Phantom Thieves, the group that steals distorted desires away from the rotten adults that misuse their power of authority. As time goes on, there are more and more interestingly crafted targets in which you steal desires from, and even more interesting friends and teammates that you recruit to aid in your rebellious group. I know it's a lot to take in at once, but I promise that the incredibly abridged version I just told is pretty well paced in game, with a ton more details that I can't cohesively shorten. This is just the main setup and premise of Persona 5, a group of kids, labeled by society, steal away the desires of corrupt adults to save the people affected by their shitty actions, in hopes to give people courage to stand up for themselves. The story gets more and more elaborate as the adults you go after have more and more power, but it never becomes so elaborate that it derails itself from its theme. I think the overall story of this game is grade A. It's a great coming of age story that uses its modern urban fantasy setting and well developed characters to deliver a thought provoking message, while also being in line with the series static theme of exploring the human psyche through religious concepts and mythos. The setting also allows for some social and political critique that I don't think could be done as well with any other setting. I think it's probably one of the most intriguing JRPG stories to be told without being overly convoluted. One that I think anyone can get wholly invested in. Royal also adds a completely new arc to the story that is also really well done. I obviously don't want to say too much about it as just the premise of this new arc is a major spoiler. What I will say though is that the new characters while they feel slightly shoehorned into the original story get to be very interesting later on. Being very different from previous arcs, the refreshingly different setting strengthens the already existing motif in a new way. And 
improves upon the personalities of already existing characters to the point that a character I once hated became my undeniable favorite. The story itself is told through long sequences of dialogue, almost like a visual novel in some regards, and while most of it is fully voiced in either Japanese or English, depending on what you prefer, expect to do a lot of reading, as there is going to be a decent amount of content that is not fully voiced as well. While I don't think I can properly critique the Japanese voice acting, as, um, as you can tell, I'm not Japanese, and I don't speak the language. In my opinion, I still found it very high quality, and I believe that English voice acting is just as good. The cast is filled with exceptional talent, some of which I think will become much more well-known in the years to come. There were only a couple of characters where I was like, eh. But for the most part, the English cast did an amazing job, and though I think some minor characters could have been improved a little, this is by far one of the best English performances in a JRPG, strengthened by a fantastic translation. Maybe a few too many, FOR REAL? Now when it comes to the gameplay, there's also a lot to unpack, so let's start off with the combat and level exploration. Like many JRPGs, the combat is turn-based with a maximum of four party members to be controlled at once. Your basic options to deal damage in combat is through the use of physical melee weaponry or ranged guns, which can also have a number of possible upgrades added to them to deal status ailments. You can also guard attacks to play on the defensive when necessary, use items to heal, deal damage, cure and deal status ailments, or change party tactics mid-battle. The main focus of combat, however, is going to be the use of personas which are unique to each party member. Nobody can use more than a single persona except for you because you're special. Every persona has differing elemental strengths and weaknesses. By using a persona's skill, you will also be using a finite resource called SP that is much harder to recover than your HP. Despite being the most important finite resource at your disposal, it almost never gets in the way of progression. There is a decent amount of easily obtained items and accessories that completely mitigate SP scarcity. The SP system isn't anything crazy or very unique, but does its job in making you decide how to properly reserve your resources when battling shadows. Enemy shadows are very similar to personas, each kind having distinct elemental strengths and weaknesses that can be exploited to knock enemies down. By knocking an enemy down, you gain an additional action to extend your turn, or the option to baton pass your extra turn to a different party member to strengthen their next attack in your stead. This is something that can be repeated and strengthened up to three times, as long as it's a different party member each baton pass. This was originally something you had to unlock for each character in the original game, but in the Royal version, you can perform it with every party member almost from the get-go, which makes combat flow smoother than it already does much earlier on. After knocking down all enemies, you can perform an all-out attack that deals a large amount of unexpected damage, but this game gives you more options than to just attack like a button-mashing troglodyte. It also calls back to earlier titles by allowing you to converse with the shadows you fight when they're knocked down. You hold them up at gunpoint, giving you the chance to rob them of money, items, or request that they lend you their strength as a new persona. However, by requesting their aid, you first have to make them like you before they choose to become your persona. This begins a small test where they ask you two random questions and you have to give them answers that match their mood. If you don't get them right, you don't get a persona. There will be times, however, where enemies won't have elemental weaknesses, which makes things a bit more complicated, as without getting a critical hit on them, you won't be able to knock them down. But you can, however, knock them down through other means by way of technical damage. By inflicting status elements, you can create chain reactions with other attacks to knock down or deal severe damage to enemies. As a small example, if you burn an enemy with a fire-based attack, following up with a wind-based attack can heavily damage and possibly knock an enemy down. This extra system of damage was in the original game, but was expanded and given more spotlight in the royal version, becoming much more useful in combat. Not only that, but as you progress through the main story, you are given more random chances of dealing high outputs of damage through the new Showtime attacks that have party members team up to do flashy moves together. They are somewhat over-the-top or comedic, but a fun addition to the combat nonetheless. With all of these different options, even trash mob fights can be both quick and fun. There are some random events that can occur in combat, such as a downed ally being taken hostage or the new addition of an explosive shadow that, well, explodes. They don't happen often, but they make regular combat a bit more engaging when they do. Combat as a whole is very fun, and I think one of the best streamlined versions of turn-based gameplay, but if you're looking for brutal and challenging turn-based combat, this probably isn't what you're looking for. That's not to say that this game can't be difficult, but I never really felt I was being backed into a corner and rammed in the ass, which, depending on your outlook, can be either a good or a bad thing. Now, the dungeon crawling aspect comes in two different forms. The first is through palaces, a pre-designed environment that plays a 
large part in the main story, as they are the different palaces in which you steal materialized desires from your targets. There are seven different palaces throughout the game that are uniquely crafted around how each target views the world around them, and each one also borrows their theme from one of the seven deadly sins that creates an overarching cohesiveness to them all. There is also an extra palace for when you're on the path to the true ending of the game, and another royal exclusive palace added for the true true ending of the game. Yes, there, there are two now. These palaces are pretty large scale, usually taking a couple hours to get through unless you really know what you're doing, and there will be times in which you'll be blocked off from continuing the exploration of these palaces until you remove the roadblocks through actions taken in the real world. Each of these palaces also had more areas and content added to their original designs that not only take advantage of the new grappling hook tool and give you more powerful items to collect, but sometimes completely remodeled areas that can freshen up the layouts for even returning fans. As you secure your route to steal a palace treasure, you will explore as a thief would, probably through ventilation, hiding from enemy patrols, hacking the mainframe, becoming the Phantom of the Opera, and obviously ambushing enemies from the shadows. Hiding and climbing is a simple mechanic. You hit X to do so in areas that you can. Finding these points of interest are pretty easy as you have the third sight ability that highlights possible interactability with your environment. The grappling hook is no different, but is very blatant about when you can use it. Just fucking beeps a shit ton and you just go, oh, yeah, I better look up. But you can use the grappling hook for more than just pizza time. You can use the grappling hook to ambush enemies to grab advantage as well. Ambushing enemies when hiding gives your entire team initiative in battle, while if you strike an enemy when they noticed you, the order of initiative is not always going to be in your favor. Conversely, if you are struck by an enemy first, you will be surrounded. This puts you at a great disadvantage as enemies gain initiative while you are left almost defenseless. Compared to the original game, it isn't as detrimental though. I remember times in the original when I got surrounded, you would assume I'd be attending the AVN awards, but in the royal version, the encounters were not nearly as unforgiving. Let it be known though, stealth is key in exploring palace. The more you are discovered by enemy patrols, the more on guard security will get. Being spotted will increase security, while defeating shadows by ambushing them will decrease security. In the original version, if the security level hit 100, you'd be forced out of the palace, but this time around, if you hit 100, it just makes getting around the palace absolute fucking hell. The stealth mechanics, while maybe being a little too good, allow for more options than just simply fighting the entire time. The exploration and stealth mechanics won't make you feel like Japanese Splinter Cell, but it's fun. Overall, these dungeons are just very interesting interesting to crawl through, although I feel like some of the puzzles that they introduce can be a bit lackluster and unchallenging. These puzzles barely take up any of your time, except for the airlocks. Fuck those airlocks. The second form of dungeon crawling is a bit more traditional, being set in a mysterious collective palace called Mementos. I say traditional, but more so it's similar to previous titles, as each area of Mementos is randomly generated instead of being predetermined like the main palaces. Each floor has differing layouts, but it does all look the same after a while aside from the occasional change in theme as the main story progresses and more sections of Mementos are accessible. Mementos is also where you'll handle requests to steal desires from minor targets that act as side quests in the game, as well as being one of the best ways to earn money, obtain items, new personas, and gain experience to level up your team. Mementos was kind of the low point for a lot of people in the original release, but Royal has done its best to spice up the monotony with some added content. Mementos now has random events called deviations that spice up exploration of any given floor, such as a floor where only high-leveled enemies spawn, or a floor that has nothing but treasure on it, along with this edition, a new mysterious character, Jose, <laughs> look at the top of his head, <laughs> adds collectible stamps and flowers to find throughout Mementos. In exchange for stamps, you can obtain permanent EXP, money, and item boost from Mementos. In exchange for flowers, you can gain powerful items through his shop. These changes make Mementos a bit more fun to explore, but also make it too easy to get an insane amount of money and EXP in a short time. Since the game allows you to insta-kill shadows that are 10 levels under you, to which you obtain money, EXP, items, and instant access to a new persona from the fight without wasting any resources, this makes the boost gained from Jose very fucking OP. So I think while the experience of Mementos has changed for the better, I also think it's a little too exploitable. The personas you collect throughout Mementos and throughout the main palaces can be upgraded in a number of ways through a trip to the Velvet Room. They can be fused together to make new personas, trained with incense that increases specific stats, sacrificed to other personas for large chunks of EXP, or even transmuted into very powerful equipment. Each persona now has unique traits, which makes fusing personas a bit more fun as it adds another layer of skill inheritance to create powerful new fusions. The total number of personas 
has also been expanded from the original release, along with a new Velvet Room event that occurs after several consecutive battles. An alarm will trigger in the Velvet Room that will allow you to create more powerful fusions and max out skill inheritance slots. If you fuse more than one time, there will be a 100% chance of a mistake fusion which can lead to a terrible fusion or a very impressive one. These accidents can also make some great skill fodder if you use the first persona you fuse during the alarm in the guaranteed accident fusion that follows. Alarms not only affect fusions though, as they also affect the other utilities in the Velvet Room with the same principle. The first use is going to get you something very powerful, while the second use will most likely disappoint you the same way I disappoint my family on a daily basis. The Velvet Room also has another addition in the form of special combat encounters to test your skills and gain rewards. I have a huge issue with these special battles though, as there is only one you can unlock without buying more's DLC. DLC is not always a blight on the video game medium, but it sure can be. In this case, the $60 worth of day one DLC consists of nothing more than horse armor, pay to win personas, and the gatekeeping of content that should have already been in the game. It is completely optional though, and not having it doesn't take away from the experience of the game in any way, so despite what I think are shitty game company practices, I can't rightfully define the DLC as a negative part of the game, except for the special battles being gated off without spending $10. But I digress. Since the work of the Phantom Thieves is something that can't be done alone, this means you also need to recruit people in the real world to aid you in your quest to reform society. To this end, you create bonds with those around you that act as accomplices that will help you whether it be a doctor who shadily provides you medicine, or a shogi player that teaches you new battle tactics. While the other world made of cognition is the source of the turn-based combat and dungeon crawling gameplay, the real world is the source of the sim gameplay. Time is important. It is also an important gameplay mechanic that forces you to wisely decide how you spend it. You have deadlines for when you need to complete your actions as a Phantom Thieves. Not completing your mission is going to give you a game over. Completing a mission progresses you to the next arc of the main story after the deadline hits, but in between these deadlines, you can choose to do a variety of activities to pass your time and aid in your work as a Phantom Thieves. Each day has two distinct halves in which you can participate in activities during the daytime usually after school or in the evening before bed. The activities themselves vary, but to simplify them, you have two types that you can invest time into. The first is confidants, in which you create friendships with people that offer you skills that can be implemented into your activities as the Phantom Thieves. If you've played a previous Persona game, these confidants are the same as social links from previous titles that also offer interesting side stories that heavily develop each confidant's character. It does take up one half of your day to spend time with a desired confidant, but these side stories are really well made and rewarding. Also, being unique uniquely crafted to further the motif of being chained down by society in one way or another. Royal adds two brand new confidants to its extensive list and completely reworks an already existing one. Confidants usually have 10 ranks that can be leveled up. Each rank provides increased EXP bonuses when fusing personas that have the same arcana alignment as the confidant, and at certain intervals, incredibly valuable skills or discounts can be unlocked. To rank up your confidant, you have to make them like you. Spending time with them and choosing dialogue options that make them not regret being associated with you will get you points towards their next rank. Confidants have been given some post rank up conversations via cell phone calls, giving you even more opportunities to gain points with them. These points you gain can also be subtly increased by having a persona that corresponds with the confidant's arcana alignment in your reserves. By the 10th rank, you complete the confidant and gain access to an ultimate persona fusion, but with party members, their persona will change into their ultimate form as well. Most confidants will require extra work to get to the end. Sometimes you'll need to finish special requests and mementos in order to max them out, or increase your own social stats before you can further a bond. You have five social stats that can be increased as you play. Knowledge, guts, proficiency, kindness, and charm. Which brings us to the second form of activities you'll be spending time on, the ones that increase your social stats. While these stats can be increased through spending time with specific confidants, the main source is going to come from a variety of activities that can be done all around the city. School events will occasionally happen where you can increase your stats, you can spend time studying in a library, read books, watch movies, play in the batting cages, work part-time jobs, order a Big Mac, spend too much time at a maid cafe because you just want to feel needed. There are too many activities it would take forever to list them all. Each one can increase different social stats that can not only help you get past roadblocks placed in the progression of some confidants, but some stats can help you in your work as the Phantom Thieves, like increasing the amount of items you can craft at your workbench, or getting underwear from your guardian for doing well on a school exam. This, you don't, you can't make this shit up. No matter what, there is always purpose to what you do around the city. There is already a lot to explore and do around Tokyo, but Royal also added a brand new area, Kichi Joji, which lets you buy new items, meditate at a temple during the day that increases your max SP, go to the jazz club at night that increases varying stats for your teammates and even skill inheritance, or the new main attraction playing darts or billiards with your team. Playing darts is done with motion controls and I can't say I love that, but it's a fun little mini game that also heavily increases the effectiveness of baton.
while passing in battle. Playing billiards is not a mini game. It's a cutscene where you try to show off. If you have proper equipment and a big enough dick, you can get your whole team excited over how you move your balls. Their excitement leads to increased damage dealt and chance of knockdown from technical damage. Small quality of life improvements have also been implemented to make things less tedious, with simple improvements such as having the skip button function on more than just dialogue, or the new assist commands that help players decide how to spend their day, the game is both sped up and more accessible to new players. Uh, as a side note, I didn't know where to put this, but they also added brand new side events with the Velvet Room Wardens, Caroline and Justine. Practically, you spend time with them at real world locations at night, and by the end of the event, you get some skill cards to use on personas. These events are cute, but nothing important at all. It's really just fan service since the confidant levels are raised by fusing specific personas and not so much spending time with them. A neat little addition I just wanted to mention. These new activities added even more to the simulation portion of the game, but at times I was getting stressed planning how I'd spend my weeks of procrastination. But compared to the base game, Royal gives you a ton more free time where the original had forced you to do nothing. I know you're not thirsty. That's bullshit. Stop lying. Lie the f down, my darling and sleep. So you really don't have to worry too much. By the end of the game, I was finished with everything I could, so I just spent time going on dates with my girlfriend. Oh yeah! Did I mention this game is also part dating sim? Oh, you smell that? I can smell the rejoice of all the lonely, sweaty weebs getting hyped to date their teacher. And I say that because I'm yeah, one of them. Yes. For the most part, the dating aspect is done very well. Female confidants will give you the option to become romantic by the ninth level, and it's not very subtle in telling you when you have the opportunity, so you don't have to worry about accidentally getting into anyone's pants if you don't want to. I know it's a problem you all have to deal with on a daily basis, so it's nice that they warn you. Let it be known that even if you're already in a relationship with a girl, you can be a complete asshole and date as many girls as you want. But be warned, unlike previous titles where the worst thing to come from cheating was making them sad because you didn't want to hang out with them, this time around there's a bit more on the line. But to be honest, not enough that it isn't worth risking at all. However, I'm a loyal man with refined taste. So, you can catch me friends zoning every thirsty woman in my path because, well, what can I say? My love is for my one and only. That fucking nose. Royal also gives us lonely gamers more special events with teammates as well as more romantic events such as White Day. Overall, the social sim aspect is a highlight of the game with characters that are well designed in both style and writing. By having interesting characters as a main appeal to the social simulation gameplay, it not only develops the world you are set in, but can also make the main story feel more rewarding. At times, I even felt like I had a friend that I wanted to protect. But the sad reality is that I don't. And neither do you, that's why we're going on dates to the amusement park with our 2D girlfriend just to get some unique dialogue. If you like visual novels or other games with large amounts of character-focused storytelling, the simulation gameplay is going to be something you'll look forward to whenever you get the chance. Something else you'll be looking forward to all throughout this game is the art style and the music. The art is spectacular and the rendering has been slightly enhanced. The overall graphics are nothing revolutionary, but it uses a style that doesn't really need great graphics. The art is consistent and eye-catching, the UI is fluid and always moving Seriously, this is the most pleasing UI I've ever seen in a game before, and the anime cutscenes done by Production IG and Domerica are pretty damn sleek, though most aren't anything to write home about. I love practically everything about how this game presents itself, but the music, oh boy, I love me a good bass. The music itself is absolutely stunning. The versatility of the acid jazz and the discography is orchestrated to create some of the most relaxing, catchy, and exciting BGM I've ever had the pleasure to listen to. Despite using acid jazz throughout most of the soundtrack, that doesn't mean it doesn't do well to incorporate other genres as well. For example, using rock music when it wants to amplify intensity, or using hard electronic music to accent the scenery of the environment. Every song sets the mood perfectly, and the diversity of the soundtrack helps to achieve that. Royal also provides 30 additional music tracks as well, and they're pretty fucking fire. Except for one song in particular, where if you were to subtract Suki from the first three words spoken in that song, it would explain perfectly what I want to do after listening to it. I hold Hold this OST in the highest regard, and 80% of it was composed by a single, overworked man, Shoji Meguro. This will easily go down as some of his best work and again cements himself as one of the best composers
users in video games today. Also, one last thing I want to mention because I forgot, Royal also introduces a new hub to hang out in separate from the main game entirely, the Thieves' Den. You can decorate it with models from the game, change your appearance to that of other characters, listen to all the BGM to your heart's content, watch any previously witnessed cutscenes, take a peek at a variety of artwork, and even play a little card game with other Phantom Thieves. All of the music decorations, artwork, and movies are unlocked with the consumption of a currency called P-Coins, which you can acquire by getting in-game achievements or winning a round of cards. Any in-game achievements also add to the decor of the Thieves' Den, and the card game is fun but at times very frustrating as the AI doesn't seem to like the idea of you playing the game. Morgana, I swear to god, you're making me want to go into the metaverse and place a nerf blaster in my fucking head. As you decorate the den, some of the characters from the game might pop up and have some conversations as well. It's a neat little behind the scenes addition, just wanted to mention that before I start talking about my final thoughts. Persona 5 The Royal is a great game. The gameplay is fluid, varied, and while somewhat easy on most difficulties, still very fun. It's not necessary to grind at all, as the leveling is well paced even for a casual playthrough, and grinding is really only necessary to beat a secret boss available at the end of a new game plus. The story and its characters, while not perfect, are well written. It's charming, engaging, has a thought-provoking message, and if you're a weeaboo who dreams of being a silent, brooding Japanese high school boy that gets all the ladies, you're in for a treat. The art and music are beautiful masterpieces. The overhaul and additions made in Persona 5 The Royal gives the game not just a fresh coat of paint, but hours of intriguing new content to get lost in. It refines the formula of past Persona games and moves the series in a great direction. There are a few downsides to this game, however, as despite having good pacing for most of the game, it does take a bit to get the ball rolling. While Royal does fix and explain some plot holes of the original story, the addition of its new arc includes some strange plot coincidences of its own. The voice acting for the most part is very good, but some minor characters aren't the greatest. The combat is fun and has gotten many upgrades to add to its complexity, but in turn also makes the game less of a challenge, mostly for veterans of the series. There is a certain palace that still falls a little flat and the boss fight has now become a living hell. Mementos, despite being upgraded, can be easily exploited and still might be a bit boring for some. The puzzles throughout the palaces are a bit lackluster, and the special battles added to the Velvet Room are kind of a joke since six of the seven are restricted by real world money. But these negatives are not detrimental to the game as a whole, and are very minor issues in the grand scheme of things. I'm still on the fence about the whole re-release after three years thing. I feel like everything added could have been done through a pricey but substantial DLC, though I'm not a game developer, so maybe there are some technical reasons I don't understand that negate that way of thinking. But a game being re-released on the same console kind of leaves a weird taste in my mouth. That being said, I still recommend this game regardless. If you've never played Persona 5, this is the definitive version, and I believe for newcomers it's completely worth your time and money. For returning fans, however, I think it's not so black and white. If you like the original, the overhaul and additions in the Royal is going to freshen the game up to the point where I think it's worth buying again. But you also have to factor in that this is a 100 hour plus game, to which it'll probably take about 80 hours to get to most of the new content. I say it's well worth the purchase, but if you just want to see the new story and really don't want to replay Persona 5, I say save your money, go watch someone play it on Twitch. While this is by no means a perfect game, it is an essential JRPG to play. One of the best. Persona 5 is a golden standard for JRPGs and Persona 5 The Royal is a better one. I'd recommend it to anyone interested, just be prepared for a long, long game with a lot of For real? Atlas, you got me. You re-released yet another of your games and I enjoyed every second of it for the second time. Honestly, I'm really looking forward to see what the Persona series has to offer and- Nah, I'm just kidding. They're just gonna re-release more games and pander for for a while. Don't mind me, I'm just gonna play Persona 4 Golden again. I hear it hits different for the fifth time. Thank you for watching and please subscribe to me. I'm very tired and desperate, so I would really appreciate the support. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, I would be honored if you hit the like button. Also, thank you everyone for 1,000 subs. I have absolutely nothing planned for a subscriber special, but Kasumi Cosplay at 100k.